introduction of guests. It's now time for members' statements. The member from Elgin, Middlesex Park. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. Parkinson's is a neurodegenerative, excuse me, degenerative. Thank you. Disease involving the malfunction and death of neurons in the brain. These neurons produce dopamine, which sends messages to the brain, which controls the body's movements. As these cells diminish, it becomes difficult for the body to control movement and coordination. Individuals who experience tremors, slowness. Stiffness, impaired balance, rigidity of muscles, fatigue, and sleep disturbances. Parkinson's affects uh, everyone differently. It can take a long time to find the diagnosis, and progression varies amongst persons. A patient's journey starts with a family doctor and continues on to touch many health care professionals, including a neurologist, a Parkinson's nurse specialist, a psychiatrist, psychologist, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, dietitian, social worker and, of course, a pharmacist, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, there's still no cure for Parkinson's, but there are new treatments coming out year to year. And I'd like to just take the moment and mention Dr. Jog, who works at the Lawson Research and Health Research Institute in London. Dr. Jog's research is using what's called Tremor Tech, which uses sensory, sensory uh, um, uh, devices hooked to software. And what they do is they detect where the tremors are occurring on the body and then inject Botox into those muscles. He's had great success. He's hoping to turn this research into practice across the province. It needs a few billing number changes, and I'm glad the Minister of Health is here because he's going to be, his office will be meeting with Dr. Jog in the near future, and I think it's a great advancement for Parkinson's across the province. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this time to thank Parkinson's Canada for the commitment in supporting over 100,000 Canadians affected by Parkinson's disease. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. I recently had the opportunity to attend Lights Out, a forum on the cost of energy in Ontario, hosted by the Greater Oshawa Chamber of Commerce. The panel focused on the rising cost of hydro and the impact it has on business and industry in Ontario. Speaker, what I heard from the presenters was that however bad we imagine the situation to be, it's so much worse. They spoke about how the system has been designed to benefit political objectives rather than to support growing businesses. They spoke about how this government signed contracts at high fixed rates and left ratepayers and businesses on the hook. They spoke about how high rates drove away manufacturing, causing demand for energy in the province to drop, leaving us all paying more for government fixed rate contracts. And I also heard their assessment of the Liberal Hydro scheme, and they saw right through it. They know that it's short-term thinking that will just cost us more in the end. And Speaker, it was interesting to hear that while the government defends time-of-use pricing, which the NDP plan would eliminate, local industry has realized that time-of-use pricing doesn't work. For example, one local high-power-using industry switched to nights to reduce costs. Turned out that with all the transportation, labor, and other night shift costs, it was more cost-effective to run smack in the middle of the day. So much for incentive. Speaker, it was an excellent event, and it provided some valuable insight into how this government's mismanagement is hurting all of us. Their energy policies have hurt our businesses, and they've hurt our potential. It's time that we turn things around. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, member Stavis, the member from the Tropical Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, for some time, the Toronto District School Board has been considering the sale of Silver Creek Public School in my community in Etobicoke Centre. My constituents and I were very concerned by this, as Silver Creek is leased to two organizations, the Etobicoke Children's Centre and Silver Creek Preschool, both of whom provide essential services to children with special needs. The property also includes green space that is very important to our community. The sale of the property would have displaced the programs, and it was unacceptable to me that we would endanger services for some of the most vulnerable children in our community. And it's for that reason that I have worked with members of my community, including the Friends of Silver Creek, Etobicoke Children's Centre, Silver Creek Preschool, members of this government and the TDSB over the past year to protect these critical services for our most vulnerable children. And our efforts have paid off. This week, Speaker, Minister of Education Mitzi Hunter and Sophie Kawala, who is the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Children and Youth Services, came to Silver Creek Public School in Etobicoke, where Minister Hunter made a very important announcement to the kids, to the parents, to the teachers, to the staff and attendants, that the government will be submitting an offer to purchase Silver Creek property from the TDSB. I rise today to thank all those who have helped Save Silver Creek and these essential services. Ministers Hunter and Coteau, staff and multiple ministries who worked so hard on this, the trustees at the TDSB, but most importantly, 
I would like to thank members of my community, the Etobicoke Children's Centre and the Silver Creek Preschool, that have dedicated countless hours to this cause. Thank you for your time, your passion, and your commitment to our community. Together, we will protect the invaluable services Thank offered you. to children with special needs. The, the member from Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate the new OFSA AAA girls hockey champions, Medway High School. On March 24th, the Medway team, hailing from Arva in the great riding of Lambton, Kent Middlesex, knocked out the top-seeded team, Lawrence Park from Toronto, in the gold medal game. The final was especially exciting because last year the Medway girls settled for bronze after being defeated by Lawrence Park in the semi-final, which just goes to show the determination and hard work of these young women who not only won the gold but went undefeated at OFSA this year with a perfect six-game run, including a dramatic win which came with a goal scored only 22 seconds before the end of overtime in their quarterfinal. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate the team, their coaches, and supporters on this outstanding achievement. Thank you for bringing home the gold. Lambton Kent Middlesex is very proud. But really, I want to congratulate and commend all the athletes who competed at OFSA in Port Credit this year. It takes dedication and perseverance to reach that level of competition, and every one of you should be proud of what you have accomplished. Thank you. Thank you very much. In 2015, Liberal adviser Ed Clark stated, having Hydro One broadly held will have favourable impact on electricity rates over time. Private sector discipline should improve Hydro One's business performance. After two years, these favourable impacts have not been seen. Instead of reducing rates as promised, Hydro One requested a 6.5 per cent distribution rate increase next year and a total increase of 20 per cent by 2022. The people of Ontario are continuing to struggle with high hydro rates, yet in this context, Hydro One executives received bloated biz uh, bonuses. The CEO of Hydro One received $4.5 million in executive compensation in 2016. In fact, the top five executives at Hydro One shared $11 million in executive compensation on top of their salaries. Privatis privatization was sold to us by Ed Clark as a means for Hydro One to undergo private sector discipline, all in the name of lower rates. We now know private sector discipline does not mean lower hydro rates. Private sector discipline means that costs will continue to rise while we lose out on valuable revenues. Private sector discipline means that five Hydro One executives receive $11 million in compensation. The privatization of Hydro One is a complete betrayal of the people of this province. This government should not put executive interests above those of everyday Ontarians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend, I had the pleasure of attending Sanja Punjab Radio and TV's 10th anniversary celebration. This evening of song, dance, and cultural entertainment attracted more than 400 guests from throughout the GTA, including my great riding of Miss Saga Brampton South. The celebration offered a taste of excellent programming and display of diversity over the past 10 years. Mr. Speaker, the Sanja Punjab Radio and TV is an excellent example of Ontario's thriving multiculturalism. In fact, multicultural media allows to share diverse cultural experiences with other communities and enriches our province. Such media also helps to build stronger communities that are informed, engaged, and empowered. I was impressed by the Sanja Punjab Radio and TV's mission to bring communities together so that we can live together in peace and harmony. Is the Ute me Bob the Sanch, the Unadi team, Sanja Punjab Radio, the TV Nu, Bot Bot Vadai Dinia? I congratulate Bob the Sanch and his team of Sanja Punjab Radio and TV. I wish them success going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Thank you. Further members, same as the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. The uh, Juno Awards were handed out Sunday in Ottawa, marking Canadian excellence in music. And I've got a great news story to tell you about Prince Edward Hastings. It comes from the music program at North Hastings High School, where Miss Diane Windmill was named the Music Counts Teacher of the Year for all of Canada. Wow. Now, Music Counts is a division of the Canadian Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences, which is the group that hands out the Junos. So getting named Teacher of the Year by them is a very significant an accomplishment, not just for Miss Windmill, but for all of the students who've been lucky enough to work with her and for the whole community and uh, the school as well, which she devotes her talents to. So you know music is a special sort of subject, Mr. Speaker, maybe unlike some other subject, it's the one where the person teaching really, really is just as important as the material and maybe even more important. So when someone comes along who can do it as well as Miss Diane Windmill, it's a right to recognize her and a good on the Junos for doing just that. The other great news for Bancroft is that the school's music program will get a $10,000 grant with the award, which she says will go toward fixing up and buying new instruments. So again, congratulations, Miss Diane Windmill of North Hastings High School. She's a very, very talented teacher. She's a very talented musician, and she can sing too. So keep on rocking, Miss Windmill, and congratulations on being named the Music Teacher of the Year. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, I'm thrilled to rise today to recognize the important work and valuable service Ontario's dentists offer to our society. Here, here. Dentists often experience significant challenges in their career, long hours, excessive back pain and continuous stress, and I've heard that they're a magnet for bad teeth stories at parties. But our dentists are among the finest in the world, and despite their challenges, many continue to offer their patients invaluable support, patience, and education to keep our pearly whites strong and healthy. In my riding, we're so fortunate to have a number of incredible dentists who are champions for oral health and general well-being and strong champions and advocates for their community. Dr. Waji Khan is a dear friend who has been practicing dentistry for nearly oh, 20 Dr. years, and while he's known throughout Kingston for the wonderful services he and his team at Cataraqui Woods Dental offers, it is also his work in the community that makes him stand out. As a recipient of the 15-year Volunteerism Award from the Ministry of Citizenship and the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal, his voluntary contributions reflect that high level of passion all dentists have for their communities and for the well-being of society. It is important to formally recognize the work and contributions of all dentists in Ontario, and this is why I intend to table a, mo a motion that seeks to proclaim April 26 as the Ontario Dentist Day later as recognition for the vital role Ontario doctors play in maintaining overall health. I'm proud to offer my support, and I hope that everyone here will acknowledge our dentists in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, point of order, the member from Wellington, Halton Hill. Taking the unanimous consent of the House to allow me to display this white pine seedling that was given to me by the Minister of Natural Resources last week on my desk while I do my statement. Agreed. The member from Wellington, Halton Hill, Agreed. seeking unanimous consent to use a prop. Do we, do, do we agree? Agreed. I did not hear a no. Members' statements. The member from Wellington, Halton Hills. Mr. Speaker, last week the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry announced the launch of Ontario's Green Leaf Challenge with the goal of planting millions of additional trees in 2017 to mark Ontario's 150th anniversary within Confederation. This initiative is inspired by the County of Wellington's Green Legacy Program, which is the largest municipal tree planting program in North America. Working with community partners, over 2 million trees have been planted in the county since 2004. This year, they plan to, to plant an additional 163,000 trees, which will help make our air cleaner and help to fight climate change. I want to commend the County of Wellington staff, in particular Gary Cousins, Mark Van Patter, and Rob Johnson for their stewardship with Green Legacy. I also want to thank past warden George Bridge and current warden Dennis Lever for their leadership. We should also acknowledge the county's CAO, Scott Wilson, and former warden, the late Brad Whitcomb, who together initiated the county's Green Legacy program. 
In May 2015, I attended a meeting in Georgetown to discuss how we might celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary. It struck me that a great way to do this would be to take the County of Wellington's Green Legacy Program province-wide, with the goal of massively expanding our tree planting efforts as a community building exercise, as well as getting people involved to help address the challenge represented by climate change. Since then, working with our municipal partners, we have been pushing the government to establish an Ontario Green Legacy Program. On October 22, 2015, this House debated my resolution calling on the government to, to establish an Ontario Green Legacy Program. It passed unanimously with support from all parties. Since then, I have been repeatedly and persistently following up with the government to urge them to implement our idea. I urge the government to actively promote Ontario's Green Leaf Challenge. We can do this creatively and cost-effectively through social media, by reaching out directly to possible partners, by advertising in community newspapers and on their websites, and by MPPs holding events. Let's work together to build the promise of the future in Ontario. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. You can take your prop down now <laughs> to make sure that it doesn't spring roots into your desk. So I thank you very much. Uh, I thank all members for their statements, even with the props, and I would like to uh, call for reports by committees. Reports by committees.